Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Discriminating Gamer, the board game review show that has no tolerance for prejudice or lactose. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to go ahead and take a look at Hammer of the Scots from Columbia Games. In Hammer of the Scots from Columbia Games, one player is going to take on the role of those kooky Scots, while the other will be the pesky English. Two great tastes that go great together. They are, they are still voting for the separation, the independence, and the UK. Scotland is? No? Are they? Or aren't they? But what, what does Sean Connery think? Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, this game is a game that, of course, recreates the historical contests and intrigue between Scotland and the uh, kooky English around the time of the uh, 13th into the 14th century. So essentially, there are two scenarios. You can either play the William Wallace Braveheart scenario, or you can play the Robert the Bruce scenario. Now, essentially how the game works is in each scenario you have a number of years, and you're playing over the course of these years, and what you're trying to do is capture the most nobles, because you each have nobles on your army. So not only are the, are the very units you're fighting with kind of your units to fight with, but they're also your objectives in the game as well. Now, you're going to start out kind of placing historically where these forces started. Now, you have castles that many of your nobles are going to start on, but in addition to your nobles, you also have some other... Um, uh, units you have, you know, infantry, archers, etc. Um, the Scottish uh, will occasionally have the help of a Norse ship. So there's there's some different little factors that play in there. Now, the beginning of every game year, game round, you're going to get five cards. Each player will get five cards. You're going to play them first thing each uh, turn, and essentially, whoever has the highest number is going to get to move first, unless somebody plays an event card, and the events can do some different things. Uh, whoever plays the event, the event triggers first, then the other player can move with their movement points. However, if you both play a, an event card, you resolve the events, and then you immediately go to kind of the wintering phase. You skip the rest of, the, of, of that year's turns. Now, essentially, when you play a card that has a number on it, you get to move that number of groups. Now, a group is any number of blocks within uh, one space. So you can divide them, move them into different spaces, but you're activating the, the group and then moving it. So you're moving, then your opponent is moving, and then after you've all moved, you're going to go ahead and do battle. Now, as far as movement goes, you can move up to six units over these green borders, which is kind of clear terrain, and then you can only move two units across the uh, red borders, which are kind of more difficult terrain. Now, you do have fog of war. Your blocks are facing you, so you don't know what the other guy, what units the other guy is coming at you with. So what you do is after each of you do all your moves, and if you move in somewhere with somebody else, he can't move out of it with, with uh, less blocks than you moved in. You, they're kind of pinned there. Uh, what you're going to do is, is go ahead. You're going to activate the, uh, the battles. The first player is going to choose which battles get activated. Uh, he has to do that before he can see which blocks are where. So he kind of has to just do it blind. He selects which battles to play, and then this is the, the block warfare we all know and love from Columbia Games. Essentially, what you're going to do is each block has uh, is rotated to its strength. Now, depending on what its strength is, that's the number of how many dice you're going to roll. You're going to look, of course, uh, you've got the, the A's, the B's, the C's. So your A's are going to roll first, uh, then your opponent's A's, then your B's, then the your opponent's B's, then your C's, then your opponent's C's. So you're going to be taking hits, and that's going to mitigate what your power is before you can go sometimes, which is pretty cool. Um, but you've got to roll a certain number at or below a certain number. So if you're an A2, you're going to roll however many dice your strength is, uh, and you've got to hit at a 2 or a 1. Now, after you go through and you resolve the battles, uh, then you, of course, move on to the next round, play cards again, do it all over again. Now, once you get to the end of the round, you have the wintering phase. Now, there's a lot of different rules for wintering, um, but essentially, you're going to uh, have all of your... Uh, characters, all of your nobles return to their to their castles. Now, if they return to their castles, however, and that's being held by the enemy, guess what? Your enemy has captured that noble, so that noble becomes theirs for the next turn. They come back in on the other side. Now, the English is going to have to disband a lot of its army if it's not wintering with the king, and the king can only winter in certain areas on the board. Um, it's Edward I, and then it's going to be Edward II, and the Scots, they have a chance to proclaim a king at one point during the game. 
Um, and so you're going to go back and forth like this until the end of the scenario. Now, during wintering, also, the Scots can replenish their armies. They look at their castle points. They can replenish their armies. They can also build, essentially, new units onto the board. The English conduct levies. Essentially, they get a lot of their kind of generic units in England that they can then move uh, in, up into Scotland for the purposes of battle. So you go through these rounds again and again and again. Again, you're trying to capture the enemy's nobles. Uh, at the, you can have sudden death at any time if ever the Scots kill the English king, one of the Edwards, or the English kill the Scottish king, whomever that is at the time, uh, then the game is immediately over and uh, whoever is the surviving king wins. Now, the other side to that is, of course, uh, if you play out to the end of the scenarios, whoever has the most nobles on their side is the winner of Hammer of the Scots. Now that is Hammer of the Scots in a nutshell. There is a lot more going on in this game. That's just a very brief, very, very, very bare overview of the rules of this game. Now, uh, if you've watched the show before, you know I'm, I'm a fan of these kinds of block war games. I think they're a lot of fun. Some I like more than others. Um, for instance, I absolutely loved Columbia Games, uh, Napoleon, um, the, the Waterloo Campaign, the fourth edition, I thought that was just so much fun. I thought it was brilliant on so many levels. Absolutely loved that game. Uh, I played, not too long ago, Athens versus Sparta, which, you know, I liked, but I had a lot of problems with. And it wasn't, to me, wasn't nearly the caliber of Napoleon, um, despite that they had a lot of similar mechanics and, and similar ways they, they worked. Um, I, I probably want to put Hammer of the Scots kind of in between the two, probably closer to Napoleon. I, I really did enjoy Hammer of the Scots. I really like that aspect of, you know, our units are what we fight with, but they're also what we're trying to capture. Uh, I really like that. That gave some really interesting strategic choices to the game and, and strategic... Um, you just had to think, well, okay, I can attack here, but I'm leaving this castle denuded. If he moves in, he's going to he's gonna get th that noble, then I'll be down that, that noble both in terms of point, and I'll also be down in terms of um, uh, uh, having a unit to fight with. You know, when, when you when you fight in a battle and you eliminate a, a unit, essentially, it's not removed from the board. You capture it, and it, it comes back in on your side. And that is 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 very cool. I, I really like that aspect of the game too, because there's this very there's a very fluid, a very flowing motion to the game because of that. And, and the nobles are on your side, and they're on the other side. And you're trying to protect the nobles because you don't want them to fall to the enemy. And but you still need maybe their striking power for an attack, and you just don't know how the battle's going to go. You always have to take the hit on the strongest unit. So that's you know it's something that man, it's just it's it, it really provides some fun and interesting strategic choice there, as I say. I I did have some issues here. I thought the rule book was a little more vague in areas than I wanted it to be. I thought it could have been laid out better uh, than than it was, and that kind of it didn't ruin the game certainly, but it but it diminished from the experience of playing this game. I thought I would have liked a more a better rule book um, fr from this game. Uh, still, all things considered, uh, really a lot of fun. I really enjoyed Hammer of the Scots. You know, if you too like these kind of block war games, uh, this is an interesting one, and this is this is one that I think will really pique your interest. So I'm going to go ahead. The recommendation of the discriminating gamer for Hammer of the Scots is buy it. I think you'll get a kick out of it. Thank you once again for joining us today on the Discriminating Gamer. As always, we ask you to please leave a comment for us on YouTube on Board Game Geek, on our Facebook page, or on the discriminatinggamer.com. We ask you to please like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and follow us on Twitter. We are the Discriminating Gamer, and i got to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, this game, playing it was a little traumatic for me, uh, Hammer of the Scots, because when I was in elementary school, I was tormented by a uh, bully fifth grader by the name of uh, Scotty Hammer. And uh, Scotty Hammer learned that I had an affinity for playing G.I. Joe. And, you know, I think he probably would have liked it too, but he didn't have all the G.I. Joes because his father wasn't a rich oil tycoon. And so he would frequently come up to me and he'd threaten me and, and beat me until one day I said, would you like to join me and, and play G.I. Joe with me? And he said, yeah, I'd like that a lot. So he came over. We played with my G.I. Joes for like an hour. We had a lot of fun. Then he said he had to go home. Uh, you know, and, and, and go back to eat. And I said, oh, that's fine. And wouldn't you know it, after he left, several of my G.I. Joe action figures went missing. That story really didn't happen, but wouldn't it be weird if it did? Please somebody help me on my feet again And I don't know where I'm going And I don't know where I've been Please somebody help me on the solid ground It's a long time
Oh, so you guys, you guys need a teacher? Sure. Need a teacher sure. Cool. Awesome. I'd love to teach you how to play this game. I'm really familiar with it. I've okay. played this, you know, several dozen times. Uh, the game itself is called New Angeles. Okay. All right, so basically, to kind of give you a little bit of context, this is this is after most of California has, due to an earthquake, has fallen off into the sea. Okay. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to is all these islands you're trying to reclaim all these oh, really? islands, right? So the government has come in, right, and they're taking over all the different islands, and they are represented by the giant robotic pieces. And you, as resistance, mm -hmm. are the little uh, 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 punk samurais. Okay. All right. So basically, what you got is you choose a character. All right, and it doesn't matter which side you look at because they're exact same size for convenience. Are you it's sure? not different. Hundred percent sure. Hundred okay. percent sure. So All you right. can play either side in case you know you flip the card. There it is. Now what you first do is you you pick a card here, mm -hmm. and then this is your these are your move actions for your turn. It's random. Every turn is random. So do you just like do you have to move around the board then? Oh no no no! What you do is there's actually these are your teleportation cards. Okay. So so you can either do an action. Okay. Or you can teleport. So like if you go here, you know you go uh, your it's riot control is what this card says. Okay. So what you can do is this is a federal card, and so you can teleport anywhere on the board to quell a riot. Okay. That has happened. Okay. So like but if I did it, my move action is when you claim this card, you gain. Five capitals. This okay. can go either way. So you grab your five pieces and you claim, you know, five capitals. So it's like risk then. No, no, it's nothing like risk. Okay, <laughs> not anything okay. like risk. Because in risk, what you do in risk, you, you got Russia, and this doesn't have Russia in it. That's the big difference. <laughs> okay, big difference. okay. So that's how you play. It. Okay, it's easy. You just follow the rules and you should be fine. Perfect.